next key fact. Primary visual cortex has a bunch of cool properties, the most important of which is that it is retinotopic. So let me show you an extremely vivid, actually downright gross, uh, depiction of retinotopy and primary visual cortex. So this is a flattened primary visual cortex from a monkey. Okay, so they actually dissect it out. Like, I don't know if it's like, I picture like baking roller things. Probably not that, but somehow they physically flatten it out. Um, but what has happened to this poor monkey was that shortly before the monkey was killed, he stared at this fixation point while this stimulus was presented. All this stuff flickering out in the periphery, that exact stimulus flickering, okay? During that time, uh, the monkey was injected with a, a substance called deoxyglucose. Deoxyglucose is uptaken by cells that are metabolically active. They think it's glucose, they think they need it to fire, they take it up, but then it gets stuck in the processing chain and it can't get broken down like glucose. And so it gets stuck in those cells that are metabolically active. You put a radioactive tracer on it, you, you, um, you look at that radioactivity after you've dissected out the brain, and you see a representation of that same stimulus. Everybody get what this is? It's kind of horrifying, but very vivid. That reveals retinotopy. What that means is that next door bits of visual cortex are responding to next door bits of space, just like they do in the retina. That happens in the retina because of optics, right? You go through a lens and you land on the back of the eyeball, you have an image, okay? Just like you do in a camera. So it makes sense in the retina, it's just optics. And here it's kind of inherited from the retina through the LGN up to primary visual cortex, where you get this representation of space laid out across the cortex. Everybody clear this is actually a really important idea, retinotopy, okay? So you can actually also see retinotopy in humans in a bunch of ways. I'll show you, I'll show you the standard way in a moment, but here's a really cool, more literal way. If you have really high resolution functional MRI, which is usually only possible with a seven Tesla magnet. That's a big deal. Most MRI, including the one in this building, is three Tesla. They have a seven Tesla magnet over at MGH, and there's a few of them around the world, and you can get higher spatial resolution. Um, and with that higher resolution, here is the analogous thing with functional MRI. You don't have to kill the person. That's always convenient. Um, uh, this person was looking at an upside down M, okay? They're fixating here, it's a little hard to see, but it's flickering. It's just like that experiment, but this person is looking at an upside down M, okay? And what you see here is the activation in their brain showing you that M. That would only be possible if we had retinotopic organization. In other words, this part of their brain is reflecting the actual image that landed on the retina. Everybody see that? Now it's upside down, that's not very interesting. It just happens to land that way in the cortex. Cortex doesn't care whether it's upside down or right side up, it cares what the information is, right? But there's another property that you may notice here. How come that M is not just upside down, but kind of wonky looking? How come this line of the M is much bigger than that line of the M? Absolutely, absolutely. So I said that we have much finer grain processing in the fovea than the periphery. And you saw that trying to count fingers out in the periphery much harder than when they're closer to the fovea. Right? And that's in part due to this um, tighter mapping from photoreceptors to retinal ganglion cells right in the retina. Right? But that greater processing allocated to the fovea is inherited up in the cortex, where you have more cortical area allocated to the center of ga uh, gaze than you do to the periphery. And so that's why they had to make this kind of crazy looking M to make it come out and look like a normal M in the brain. They had to do the opposite. They had to make it much bigger in the periphery to compensate for the fact that the cortex allocates more area to the fovea. Does that make sense? That's called cortical magnification factor, the fact that you just allocate more cortex to the center of gaze than to the periphery, right? So um, that's kind of a cool stunt that you use if you're lucky enough to have access to a seven Tesla scanner. But the real way people look at retinotopy uh, and visual cortex more standardly is to just map coordinates onto visual cortex. And usually they use polar coordinates when they do this. And so an experiment goes like this. Here's a classic experiment. These things started in the early 1990s and are now used a lot to map out retinotopic cortex. So the poor subject is lying in the scanner. In the early days when we did this, we did this with a bite bar. So we 
treated ourselves like monkeys. We had to hold our heads really, really skill, still to have high resolution. And so we'd make these really gross custom fitted plastic bite bars that you bite into and then the plastic hardens and you bolt it onto the scanner to hold your head perfectly still so you don't have head motion, right? Head motion blurs MRI images, mucks up your data. And so it'd be lying there on a bite bar for like two hours, staring at that dot in the center while rings of flickering activity would be moved out in our visual fields like this, okay? To separately map the fovea versus the periphery. Okay, so this is a dynamic stimulus. You would be fixating here and it would be going like this, okay? It's, you know, fine for the first minute and then you're gonna stay in for another two hours <laughs> or maybe depends how long. Okay, so that's how you map out the R component of the R theta polar coordinates, right? And when you do that, here's what you see. You can put a map directly on the brain. So this is now the medial surface of the left hemisphere. So again, it's like you looked at the side of my head, you took out my right hemisphere, and you're looking at the inside surface of my left hemisphere, right? What is that sulcus right there where primary visual cortex is? What is that sulcus called? There's a fold in the brain, which is where primary visual cortex lives. It's called the calcarine sulcus. Not very interesting, it just comes up a lot. You know this word because you will encounter it. Calcarin sulcus is the fold in the brain where primary visual cortex lives. It's very convenient. It means you can find it, right? So that's right there. That's V1. And what this is showing us is that there's a wave of, um, of peripheralness of the stimuli that drive those neurons. Okay, so that's the code of the location in the stimulus that drove the activity here. Okay, so this part of the brain way at the back does it respond to the fovea or the periphery? Fovea, yeah, right. You got pink and blue at the fovea and here's pink and blue right there. So that part responds to the fovea. When those flickering checkerboard rings get farther out in the periphery, the green and, um, and turquoise, you're way out here. So does everybody see how that's a mapping of R onto the surface of the brain? Um, that's going to be the next visual areas, right? So now we're getting outside of this map, okay? And exactly what part that is, I don't know my visual areas all that well. It gets incredibly complicated once you leave V1. It's probably, it's probably V, it's probably gonna be V2. Um, but I gotta think about that. Yeah, it's probably gonna be V2. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so you can see there's a whole map here. Okay, so that's just R. What about theta? We said we we're gonna do polar, polar coordinates. Well, to do that, you do the same thing, but now you keep your eyes fixated here and you make this wedge of checkerboards and it moves around like that real party, okay? And then you look at activity in the brain and what you see is corresponding activity here. So here again, we see this upside down business that you saw with that M. The stuff on the bottom part of the back of the occipital lobe responds more to the upper visual field, the cool colors, and the upper part here above the calcarine sulcus responds more to the lower visual field. Everybody got that? Okay, so this is just another way to show retinotopy. Everybody got it? It's just like a piece of retina up there in the brain. All right. Okay, so that's nice. That tells us what the receptive fields are of cells in those different patches of cortex, where in the world they respond. Um, but how do individual neurons in there respond? 